Rob Gill, just before we kick this off, and then we'll yes. do an official. So I, I, I'm down. Are you? Are you? Are your eyeballs swollen? Because that's what I'm really curious about. Because I'm a little you know, bit of nerve. You know, I can never know when the tears are going to come or not. It's just a natural <laughs> byproduct. So. You know, we'll, we'll have to see on that. When I was little, they did call me Waterfalls. That was a nickname I had back in the day. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, listen, anytime um, Sean talks to anyone, it's a 50% chance of tears. When it's Rob, yeah. Gill, and Sean, it's a 90-10. So just <laughs> gear up. Uh, so listen, I'll turn it over yeah, to you. Crazy. Over to you. Let's We're go. We're going to get this recorded. Let's go, Big Boo. Official kick, and then you can take yourself off of the camera. We'll let the two, the two boys get after it in this unblinded, real, raw play. Fernando, we are recording. What is going on, world? And thank you to all of you for watching this video, whether you're coming out to our podcast, whether you're within Mastery, whether it's your first time being exposed to Unblinded. We Rob thank Gill is in the house. <laughs> Sean is on Blue fire, wide. Check out Blue 21. On the and ball, no you. huddle, five wide, coming up with Rob Gill. When we get Sean in this energy, it is notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of information. So I'm excited. Yes, we do have Rob Gill, president and founder of Epic Wealth, partners with Sean Callagy, friends. They were, you know, beyond friends. They are probably the funniest two individuals together. They've been working alongside for over two years. And this morning we had an amazing huddle. And these right here are 60 minutes. Are hey, brother, I can't hear a word. Just so you know. Real, raw sales role play as Rob gets a voice message, all good. And we're gonna kick it right in. So on these 60 minutes, we have you know an expert in their field, which Rob is, try to sell Sean on products and services, which is financial planning. And then we're gonna have a pause. When we get to about 30 minutes, I'll make a ding, there'll be a sound. Everyone will laugh because it'll sound funny. And then Sean- I can't hear you guys. Can you hear us now, Rob? I think, I think Rob Gill is getting like cold feet and he's like, fake confusion into technological problems. Oh man, I haven't heard that word in a while. Fake confusion is right, sir. Yeah, so we're working on it. So, so while, while we're working on, Rob, you still don't have us, brother? He is still frozen, Mr. Callagy. All right, so Jared, if we could work on that in the background. Let me share a little bit of what's happening. So um, I'll, let me set this up, Fran, while we work on Sir Rob. Hello, thank you. Okay, so. Can, just just can you guys text Jerry with Rob so we, we get the technical uh, worked out. So everybody out there, so here's what we're doing. We are doing these. This is the second one. We're going to do these every day with whoever, whomever is the huddle guest. And the outcome is to, and we're having fun, right? So we're laughing. So forgive me if you're not in a fun mood. There's a lot of challenging things going on. I just got off some incredibly heavy phone oh. calls with people from organizations and other places. So please understand that don't mistake our fun for not taking what's happening right now in the world seriously. And I have people in my family that are working in hospitals. Um, I had somebody I love and care about dearly uh, pass away from cancer uh, yesterday. And unfortunately, they're, they're not going to really have a funeral in the ordinary sense of a, what a funeral should be. So I'm, I am connected to the pain in the world, but I'm also connected to the fact that we want to appreciate and have gratitude for what we do have, not just what we don't have. And we're here to create acceleration and breakthroughs and to demonstrate the magic of the formula by having people like Courtney Epstein yesterday, thank you, Courtney, did a beautiful job, um, share and, and influence me from Hello to Yes, sell me, educate me on something, and then we reverse it and I sell what they're selling. And we see the insights and the breakthroughs and the accelerations even coming from people of, uh, who are successful like Courtney, Rob. So, Rob, do you have any issues? Are you able to hear Rob? Are you hearing yet? Yep, I can hear you now, brother. There right. we go. Yeah. So Rob, Rob Gill is coming out of the locker room, ready to go. And and with that said, so let's drop in. So Rob, um, I I want to acknowledge that we have fun. Rob has given me permission to coach him like I was coached. I said in the huddle this morning, coach him like I was coached means people who scared the heck out of me in the beginning, uh, and I understood and knew that they were telling me the truth because they love me. And I'll drop in with a quick acknowledgement of a couple of people so you can get the context for the coaching structures that we follow and some of what we do here at Unblinded. Um, you know, I, I moved to Emerson, New Jersey. I was 11 years old. And it was a time of incredible um, athletic acceleration. Guys, you know, I don't know what's happened. 
some news, some noise, some stuff going on there, uh, Jared, Fernando, Rob. I can still hear you. Cool. Okay. So I moved in 11 years old. It was a time of great sports success in this small town of Emerson, New Jersey. I was very disappointed and sad to have moved. I loved the town of Richfield Park where I came from. And when I got to Emerson, um, the, the athletic teams, the wrestling team, the baseball team, uh, and the football team had iconic coaches and massive success. My high school baseball coach, Larry Ennis, had been a called, called a mentor by Bill Parcells. When Larry Ennis passed away, God rest his soul, who the Emerson um, scoreboard and football co the athletic complex is named after. Um, when he passed, Bill Parcells, the Super Bowl winning coach of the Giants, called him a mentor of his. So like my mentor was called a mentor also by Bill Parcells. My high school wrestling coach, Stan Woods, is currently, look him up on Wikipedia, Stan Woods, the winningest high school wrestling coach in the history of the state of New Jersey. Um, he's won, uh, he's been coaching for 53 years and never had a losing season. Won state championships, state sectional championships. I mean, I don't know, 30 league championships, some crazy number. Um, coach Woods, unbelievable. And our high school, um, our, my freshman high school football coach was Dennis Slazak. Um, along with another iconic coach, Bob Karsich, um, who went on to be just a legendary baseball coach in his own right after Larry Ennis retired. And Coach Slazak was literally the scariest human being I ever met. And Coach Slazak, coaching our high school freshman football team, we were told we were going to be the end of progress and acceleration at Emerson High School in, in New Jersey. And Coach Slazak uh, just blew us up every day um, to love and believe in each other to challenge us, scare the heck out of us, and eventually show us how much he loved us. And to this day, Coach Slazek is in my life. I was blessed to have him uh, at our Caligula Christmas party this year. And all these people are iconic people to me. And what they have in common is they all told me the truth. They brought out the best in me. They made me egolessly open to coaching. That's why I could be vulnerable. I could be real. It's why I have no ego attached to innovating and accelerating in service of you and everybody out there. And that's why I think a lot of people galvanize around what we're doing because we're real. And that's why we're calling these the unblinded, real, raw um, sales role plays because this is what it looks like. It's not just, you know, frou-frou content. It's not just, hey, like, you know, be happy and be inspired. And I'm not minimizing inspiration because those coaches I just mentioned, they were inspirational humans, but they also told me the truth. They taught me to practice. They taught me to drill. They taught me when I felt sorry for myself and I, I got full of myself. They kicked my butt and made me cry, told me you know, what it was. So that's what I bring is that tradition of love, of truth, of authenticity and power, right? And, and just, and some fun because they were funny too, right? Uh, you didn't want them to be unhappy with you, but they were funny as well. And that's what we bring to these, these dynamics of acceleration. And Rob has been a brother and Rob has opened himself up to that level of coaching from the day we met. And Rob and I have had arguments. We've had battles. We've had some tears. We've had some hugs, we've had some loves and we've had a lot of laughs. And I, I love this man and uh, he's not perfect. I'm not perfect, but his heart is pure and his acceleration has been tremendous going from eight to 25 to 175 sales meetings a month. And he's, he's followed the pattern and he had to go, we had to break Rob down a little bit, like, just like I had to be broken down at times in my life. Um, and all of us, because there was ego and there was knowing this because he had a lot of success before he met me. And I'm so honored that he opened himself up. I'm so honored that he's been a, a man who's 23 years sober. And I had the privilege of giving him his coin at his AA meeting. Um, I've gotten to know his beautiful and incredible wife, Janet, his amazing uh, sons, Rob and Riley. And they, and, they're, they're in the, the process of breaking each other down, accelerating their own learning growth and development as young athletes. And it's a beautiful family, beautiful times. And we're going to have some fun on last day. Uh, the one and only Rob Gill. How are you, brother? Did we lose Rob again? Thank you, Sean. Can you hear me? You're right you. here. Can you, can you guys hear me? That's not a yes momentum. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yeah, we got you. Yes. We're loud and clear. All right. Sean, thank, by the way, thank you for that introduction, number one. I, I missed the last 30 seconds, but I know you were talking about Janice and, and, and you know, my relationship Robert, with my wife. Robert and Riley and how incredible they are. So, and yeah, what and you're 
don't forget about Reese. That's the, the, that's our, you know, that's our, that's our daughter who's eight and she's probably the best athlete that we have. And, and I know you understand. I, that, I would but. never leave Reese out of it. And I'm sure she's going to be a much better athlete than you were. Yo, no doubt about it. No <laughs> doubt about it. She reminds, me, she reminds me of my sister, Amory, in the sense that, you know, Amory passed away a couple of years back, but Amory was the first girl in little league in Bayonne. And she was a dynamic basketball player that played for St. Anthony's in her first year of high school. Wow. First two years. Yeah. So she was, uh, she was tremendous as a basketball player. And for those of you that don't know, so I'll give you the shortcut. So when Rob and I talk athletics, we have some mentors in common. Rob and I didn't know each other growing up, but we met later in life, but we had mentors in common, people that changed my life because they told me the truth and had major impacts on Rob's life as well. And when Rob says St. Anthony's, Google it, look it up. Uh, it's the most successful high school basketball program in the history of this country run by the one and only Bob Hurley, who married into Rob's family. So Rob's been around elite level coaching and breaking stuff down. And Coach Hurley put uh, more D1 players out of that high school, I believe, than any high school in the country. Um, NBA players all over the place, including his son, the, the one and only lottery pick, Bobby Hurley, uh, that went on, you know, won national championships at Duke. So just incredible pedigree of understanding peak performance. And so that's where we are. And Rob, just in the sake of everybody, let's drop in, brother. So what Rob's going to yep. do is he's going to take me from Hello DS in selling to me um, his products and services. So take it away, Rob. Yo, as though we don't, I'm, I'm me, you're you. We don't know each other. So take it away. Hey, what's up, Sean? How you doing? I, I wanted to uh, just let you know that I was at Rooney's Crab House and I came up to you afterwards and I introduced myself. Uh, I think we had a connection with the FA from Jersey City when you were sharing your whole story about um, your two, you know, jury verdicts in 2014 and 16. And as I was sitting there watching you, I had just come from Tony Robbins a month and a half before that. And all I saw was a living, breathing example of what Tony Robbins talked about for four days when I was in Newark. And what's interesting is I had been searching for that. Um, you know, I've been visualizing, Hey, you know, who could train me in this and how can I learn this and how can I get a real time um, example, because that's what I was used to growing up. I needed to see for me in the way I think real time examples. And brother, when I saw you speaking the other night, you know, there was no hesitation and that I felt like I was in the presence of greatness. And I'm not just saying that um, your, your, your presentation was very powerful. And I wanted to thank you for that because I had no interest in going. I want to thank Mike Fallia for that. And he was the one that brought me there and dude, you just crushed it. And when I, when I heard afterwards, that you shared with me when we were privately talking for a couple of minutes that you were visually impaired. I didn't even say, I, you know, I couldn't even comprehend. It didn't even look like that to me. You know what I mean? So, so to not even lead with that, talk about that, tell your story. Uh, and you touched on some tremendous victories in the game of life. It was really powerful. And I was grateful for that. And I'm so glad I went and uh, really grateful for this opportunity to spend with you over the next 45 minutes. And, you know, just kind of share my experience, strength, and hope, and hopefully it can have an impact on where you are, where you're going. And uh, I just love to kind of learn a little bit more about you. Would that be okay? Yeah, amazing. So I'm going to drop in and coach at certain moments for you reverse. Um, so I'm at, at, I'm out of role. That was an outstanding opening acknowledgement. I might have tightened it a hair, shortened hair is beautiful, congruent, um, appropriate, deep reflective of a whole bunch of different things. Fantastic job, deep listening going on, um, which might've tightened it a hair. That's all, like shortened it. You know, maybe if it was yep. three minutes, maybe made it two. So just a okay. thought, um, but fantastic job. I would go, you know, for that acknowledgement, opening acknowledgement, all the pieces in it, I'd go 9.5. So, and Rob's awesome, could have been higher. I mean, right, those are su slightly subjective numbers, of course, but Rob, great job, back into role. Thank you. Yeah, Rob, yep. thanks, thanks for saying all that. I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, what's on your mind, brother? Well, you know, what stood out for me, I'm a Hudson County guy, and you had talked about the other night that your mom, um, you know, you, your mom and dad are from Hudson County, Jersey City in particular. And, you know, they, you at some point spent some time there. Can you share a little bit more with me about that time and then your transition to Emerson and what that was like? Yeah, no, th thanks for asking, Rob. Um, I'll say it this way, Jersey city, my family has shirts say where it all began. And 
both sets of my grandparents, my dad's parents and my mom's parents are from Jersey City. And you and I both know what it means to be from Hudson County. So while I, I went to Bergen County High School, I was born in Hudson County, which to me gives me the, the best of like all worlds. And my parents got divorced when I was one. Um, so we live with my mom's parents. None of my grandparents um, went to college. In fact, um, none of my grandparents graduated from high school. And it was a, a, an incredibly interesting uh, place to grow up. And I got out when it well, were to be when I was little. Um, and everybody in my family lives and breathes Jersey City. Um, so my, my nanny and pop, um, you know, you and I are having a call from Long Beach. I'm in Long Beach Island, New Jersey. They sold their primary residence in Jersey City uh, in, the, in, in the early 90s, and um, which they had you know, bought for like $5,000, saving every penny they had a long, long time ago. And they sold it and lived in a tiny apartment, still lived up there, and, but had a place they could rent down here. And I don't know how they did it. They never made more than like $20,000 a year, my grandparents combined. And they, they taught me everything about life and my, my grandma Rose, I never knew my dad's father, my grandma Rose, um, who I would stay with half the time when my mom was working uh, and my dad was working, um, just an incredible human being. And they had the most salt of the earth core values imaginable. And so when I think about Jersey City, I think my grandparents first. And I think what they taught me, who they are, and what it meant to be in a community, what it meant to love people, what it meant to have my grandfather, my, my mom's father teach me to be respectful of women, uh, be respectful of people who were um, of a different color, different belief structures. In fact, he had fights at work because the first African-American that ever worked for public service in Jersey City, he had over for dinner. And um, he also taught me to stand up for what you believed in. And if you had to go throw down, and do whatever you had to do. Um, to fight uh, what's right and people uh, to do it. So when I think Jersey City, I think love, I think community, I think fight for what's right, I think overcome, I think all of it. So that's what I think. Wow. Asking. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of information. And when I think about um, a lot of different access points, you know, your, your family tree seems to be very powerful. Your grandparents seem to be a staple uh, in who you are today. Um, and being that they were able to take that income and at the same time teach you values from the age of one on, I can't imagine what was going on in those living rooms every holiday, uh, every, you know, every family lesson, everything that must have been going on in that place to learn all the stuff and, and be able to kind of articulate it the way you're articulating it. It's pretty impressive. And, and, it seems like to me that the head start you were able to get from those experiences really began to kind of shape you at such an early age. You must have been a deep thinker from day one. Um, can you still hear me, brother? Yeah, no, thank frozen you. frozen on your side. No, I'm good. Can you hear me? Hello? Fernando, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. In and out. And Rob, you're good in too. Uh, twitching, but please keep going, brother. You're good. Now I yeah. got you. Now I got yeah. you. Yeah, sorry. So, so yeah, yeah, Rob. And guys, we'll get these technical okay. difficulties squared. So, I heard you. So, your question was deep thinker, right? And yeah, and so, so the, yeah, so the access point. So, you know, growing up with your grandfather, he seems to have been a very paternalistic model for you, uh, as well as your dad. I'm, you know, I'm sure, but I'm just hearing a lot about your grandfather right now and your grandmother, Nani and Poppy. And growing up in that environment, can you tell me a little bit more? I think you shared a lot, but what that was like at that particular point when you were kind of looking outside and seeing other influences, how did that feel? And what was that like? Yeah, amazing. Quick coaching point. And can you hear me, Fernando? Yes, we can hear you, Sean. Yeah, great. Just give me, just give me a yes. It's only, thanks, brother. So thank you. Um, so quick coaching note. I would say, Rob, Beautiful job, deep listening. I, I would shrink the questions a little bit for everybody's edification. So first of all, beautiful question by Rob when he asked me about Jersey City, right? And that took me, and everything I'm saying is I'm, I'm being like real, how I would be in an environment where I have a little bit of time to talk. And that's exactly what I would say. 
So he took me, gave me such a beautiful opportunity by asking about Jersey City to, which I did talk about the night that we met, to ask me questions that took me to, like into my heart and soul, right? And so I'm loving the conversation. Hello. Yeah. So um, can you hear me, Franda? Yes. Yeah. You're, you're straight, Sean. So you're good. It's, um, it's just internet and Zoom things on Rob's side. Okay. So, right. Let's keep going. So just text with Rob. Ask Rob to text back and forth if he's not hearing. Yep. So, so what Rob did well was ask that question. What, what got a little bit long, what got a little bit long, just mute Rob while he's okay. rustling. Um, I'm having a hard time here, brother. Okay. So let's, let's keep going for now. And I'll we'll talk about Rob and let's see if we get Rob squared away. So what, what got long though, was when Rob started getting into like extra lengthy acknowledgements on different issues. What could have been perfect is when I completed that last discussion point, Rob could have said, Hey, your grandfather, you all your grandparents sound amazing. Like just that. Yeah. Like just it could have shrunk to, Hey, all your grandparents sound amazing. And left it there. Pause. And if I started talking, let me go. If I didn't start talking, it could have been like, yeah, like your grandfather sounds like he was like super fired up and intense, eh? You know, like, and just that acknowledgement, because I brought everybody brings up and wants to talk to you about exactly what they want to talk about. So if I mention my grandparents, I want to talk about my grandparents. Yeah, sure. And so back. Rob could have picked any one of them. So I would say super short and go from there. But yep. so Rob, please continue. So, so your grandparents must have been your superheroes, which is unbelievable. And, um, you know, I say that because, I, you know, I, I'm not sure what, in my world, I don't know what that felt like. And I can't imagine, you know, your parents getting divorced at such a young age, you were one year old, and, you know, becoming who you are today is really a community of Caligis and, um, you know, Bastics that raised you, right? So that's how I look at that. And, and uh, I want to thank you for sharing that with me. Um, just unbelievable when I, when I look at who you are today. So what was the transition like for you when you did go from Jersey City to Bergen County? These are different temperatures, different flavors, um, you know, different speeds. I'm interested to find out what that must have been like knowing on weekends or, or you know, at family dinners, you had such a Hudson County. Yeah. So I would say there was like a, a, a soft transition because I went from Jersey City to Richfield Park, which is like Southern Bergen County, sort of like, or, or, or like Northern Hudson County, right? Or Western Hudson County. So it's like, you know, a, a closer to a, the Jersey City mix and then to Emerson. So I had a little stop over in between. But by the time I got to Emerson, yeah, it was a lot different. And what was really funny is I think I had this belief structure when I got to Emerson that they weren't as tough as people from Hudson County, Richfield Park, you know, uh, you know, from Jersey City. And I was in for a rude awakening on day one of playing Kill the Carry in the playground because my friends and brothers that are still friends of mine to this day from Emerson, they had the same thing I'm talking about, my grandparents and that, my family in Jersey City and the mentors I had there. These, they were the same kind of people. It was like, it was like I was beamed into a parallel universe where yeah, there was woods and there was some space, but it was blue collar still. And it was like family and core. And that's what was present. And, and the first day on the, on the playground and kill the carrier, everybody was trying to kill me because I was the new guy. And it felt just like what you'd experience in Jersey city. And, <laughs> but, but there was like all kinds of love same way. So it was, it was interesting because I underestimated their resilience, their toughness, their heart all those things, but I found such commonality. And so first year or two was hard. And by the time I hit high school in Emerson, I felt like I loved it with every part of my heart and my soul. It was just such an incredible place because of the mentors, the brothers, the people that were there, the success that that town desired to create on the athletic fields and in their hearts and their pride for their, the community. Um, and and this, this sense of like their belief in your well being and your future and quite frankly, Rob, like with everything I'm doing in the space of personal development, 
a lot of it's to give people what I was given by my family and that Emerson community to give that to them because I don't think there's a lot of places you can find in the world. And I feel like I was given so much, not, not financially, but in love and mentorship and guidance. And that's what I want to give to people. So that's what it was like. Well, Sean, that's amazing. And, and you know, when I think about it, I, I, your first two years were a challenge as you're developing relationships, uh, but it sounds like you've been, you were surrounded by a high level of achievers and success that were good models of the world for you. Is that, is that fair for me to, am I understanding that properly? Yeah. I mean, yes. And, and I, I do also say this though, you know, I had a lot of people that grew up in the same mm, environment that I here. did. This is horrible. Can you hear me? No, Rob, you can't listen. Let's do this, Rob. Let's figure out, um, Fernando, Jared, can you figure out an alternate way to plug Rob in in any way? See if we can. Um, hey, Sean, yeah. can you hear me? Mute Rob for now. Mute Rob. All right. So let's take it from here. Let, let me reverse this and play because I, I want it in honor of everybody. We'll, we'll redo Rob in a different day. Fernando, I'm going to reverse this. I'm going to be Rob and you're you. Okay. We'll take it from there to serve people. Ready? Let's do it. So, so, um, hey, Fernando, how are you? Uh, I'm doing well. What's happening, Sean? Hey, listen, um, Fernando, uh, I'm excited to talk. You call me Rob. I'm Rob. Hey, Rob, what's happening? Yeah. So, so listen, Fernando, um, you know, I know that you have a lot of things going on right now, but I, I don't feel like we know each other that well. I know we both have like Sean in common and I'm blinded in common, but I don't feel like I know you that well. And I'd love to get to know you a little better if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, go for it. Awesome. So, um, first I want to, yeah, first I want to acknowledge this, the space that you're operating in and what I've watched you do, like I, I didn't like you in the beginning and I wasn't sure what your intentions were. I wasn't sure who you are. And I just want to be totally real. You know, I'm from, I'm from Hudson County and we come from Hudson County. We could fall into a little bit of blame and judgment and we could yeah. be pretty uptight about things. And, but what I've watched you do over the past six months and in particular, the past two months, I can't believe what you're doing. And you have become like the greatest student in this technology. And it's unbelievably impressive how you've accelerated. So I just want to acknowledge you for that and your heart and your commitment to mastery. So thanks for being an inspiration and thanks for showing me that I could be a little bit quick in blaming and judging people. Well, Rob, you know, I appreciate that. Thank you, you know, for saying those things, seeing those things and, you know, continuing to, to crush what we're doing here. I'm yeah. back. All right. So Rob Gill, I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to sell you on you. Can you hear me clearly? As soon as you can, we're just going to go back to Fernando and we'll give it one more shot for now because we'd always redo it a different day. Are you good with me or no? I'm very good. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, yeah. yeah. So, so we're going to go. So what, what time you got, Fernando? It is 3.30. I was about to ding. So we are at a halfway mark. So right. perfect timing. Yeah. So Rob, I want to, I want to give you another shot um, technologically at yep. five more minutes. Let's skip to you delivering, so let's assume you've, here's what you've elicited from me. We've connected deeply. You've heard me. I feel seen, heard, and validated. You've heard me share that my life's mission and purpose is to create massive impact of influencers influencing influencers to merge ecosystems for one plus one equals a trillion relationships to make the world an even greater place. And the reason for that is because I think I'm gonna be held accountable to my higher power someday and i want to have the right answers and my way of doing that is to build unblinded into something that disrupts marketing sales personal development coaching training networking all of it into something that's infinitely more usable reproducible and the educational systems for people you've heard all that right and then you've heard me say that some of my frustrations are um, in, in the space of financial is sometimes having the right tools and instruments and advice because I just think that it's like S and P 500 and, and hold on, but like someday it's not going to be the right solution because what if I turn 70 and you know need access to money at some point? Like I'm not sure. Like I read the only investment guide you're ever going to need, 
And I'm like, S&P 500, hold on. Uh, I think life insurance is term and invest the difference. And, but I want to make sure I make the right decisions because I want to build my legacy and my contribution at a massive level uh, for helping causes like the American Foundation for the Blind um, and other beautiful causes like Operation Underground Railroad. Um, and I want to have massive impact for people and inner city environments and the educational environments. So I want to make sure that I build and grow my financial world massively. You've, you've heard all that. And to, yep. to not do that will be incredibly upsetting. Yes. Now we're at the spot where you go, hey, is it okay if I tell a little bit about myself? You have yep. seven minutes left. Yep. Fernando's going to give you a ding at four minutes, right? Yep. And, and we're going to bring it home. So you're going to give yep. me, now you have steps three and four, unique identity of agreement formation. Hit me with your transition and go. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you. Sean, thank you for being so open. Thank you for explaining to me some of your challenges, uh, as well as your world-class vision and your, your generational um, opportunities that you're looking to create for everybody that you're involved in and all the different groups that you want to have a positive impact on, not only from American Foundation, but from the blind, but also from uh, freeing ch uh, children from sexual slavery, changing the educational system, being present to what you do on a daily basis. So when you do meet your higher power, you could you know, look your higher power in the eye and tell them you did everything you could through Unblinded to share your experience, strength, and hope of integrity-based human influence, Calgary results formula, and really be able to have all that in your space as you're working on a daily basis. What I can say from a planning perspective is, you know, every time I get involved with somebody and I start to develop a relationship, the bottom line is people are bombarded with information all the time, whether it's on TV, whether it's their neighbor, whether it's their current planner, uh, whether it's somebody that they're really good friends with. There's always some kind of information coming out when it comes to financial planning, which by the way, those rules change every single day. So the first thing that's the most important thing is what is your economic philosophy? And I think we're zeroing in on that. Um, and as we zero in on an economic philosophy, you know, what I've learned through our conversation is money is not important to you to go on a European vacation. Money for you is about giving it away and building something sustainable, right? So, you know, we look at, we want to know what the outcome is. You clearly know what your outcome is, right? There's no doubt about it. And then when it comes to proper planning, you just touched on the S&P 500, which by the way, in theory, has averaged 10% since 1926. The challenge with that is when a pandemic comes out of nowhere and the Dow drops 11,000 points and you're 65, even though you're not 65. But in that scenario, there becomes a challenge because at 65 is normal retirement age. And during that time is when people want to start taking money out of the market for the rest of their life. For example, if you had $5 million in January, that would be worth three and a half million today, if it's just in the S&P, right? So for us, we wanna make sure, and I'm just giving approximates, we wanna make sure that we understand all of the advantages and disadvantages of different products, including the tax liability of those products. We then wanna create models and maps that sit and fit with your core values that we're constantly monitoring and constantly adjusting based on current information. And we also want to be able to understand uncorrelated assets to correlated assets. What does that mean? Very simply, an uncorrelated asset would be the law firm. It would be unblinded. It would be real estate. And it could be life insurance. A correlated asset is obviously the money that's inside the market. So once we have a global understanding of that, and then we tie it back into who you are, what your core values are, we could then create a map and a model that, that ties all that in. And by the way, we have an online, um, we, we've created a website specifically for you where you can see all your financial data on one landing page that is tied into all the financial institutions that you do business with. Why is that important? It's important because any decision you make is going to be based in that space because you have a philosophy based on logic, math, and science, not a gut level hunch or emotional timidity. When, if you don't have a philosophy and coronavirus hits, there's a lot of people out there that are making irrational decisions based on current news, which is changing every single day, right? So, so for us, it's important to understand what does term and invested difference mean? Well, it means let me put money into term insurance, take that difference and put that into a 401k. That's great. 20,000 a year for 30 years. Guess what? I can't get insurance because I'm 65. And oh, by the way, the money that I had in the 401k is worth a lot less than it was even two months ago. And it doesn't even include when I take it out, what are the taxes going to be? So here's the point. Not one product is the best way to go. It's about a process. 
It's about a philosophy and a strategy on how you tie life insurance with your wealth management, with your businesses, with your uh, philanthropic, you know, philanthropic duties, because you want to make sure that those, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the Caligi Foundation, American Foundation of the Blind, that when you do leave this mortal coil, that they are fully enriched by the money that you can leave behind while at the same time not affecting your family and your business and being able to reduce your taxable estate during that process. So whenever we do a clinical approach, we want to be able to, just like if you're going to go to a doctor, they're going to check everything out. They're going to do a financial checkup. Well, they're going to do a health checkup. We do a financial checkup from the neck up. There's one nursery rhyme and I'll leave it at that. The point is we want to be able to put all this, lay this all out, sit down with you and your team, because I believe that every person should have their accountant, their financial planner, their trust officer, and their insurance agent on the same page for the benefit of the client. So all the decisions that are made are made as a team, and it's going to force the four professionals to work together. And with that being said, what I'd love to do is just gather more financial information and take you through the next step of our, of our process. Would that be okay with you? Um, what does that look like? Well, no, got What's that? Sorry. Yeah. What happens next? So what will happen is next, I will gather all the financial data that you have, your wills, your trust, your business plan documents. I want to see your key man, key woman policies. I want to see your buy-sell agreements. I love to look at your individual plan. I love to know the philosophy behind everything that you have. So, you know, we'll take some time and do a deep dive into some more questions and really doing a job of getting to know you at the highest possible level. Once we gather that data, we then want to sit down and review a game plan on how you want to move, how we can move it going forward. That once again, can not only touch on you and your world and your retirement, but Calgary law unblinded and all the different foundations and charitable ventures that you're part of. Um, it seems, you know, Rob, I, I like you a lot. Um, it, it sounds a lot like things I've heard other people say before. And I, I really do. And I, I've just had a lot of disappointment and frustration because a lot of these books that I read explain what to do with your, you know, your resources. And, you know, my understanding and that, you know, I've heard, you know, a little bit about what you shared. It feels like, like life insurance is a part of the planning. And, you know, I, I've just had a lot of people in my life say life insurance fees are extraordinary and commissions are huge. And, you know, this is something to just stay away from because that, because if it was, if it wasn't so great for the insurance agents, they wouldn't sell it because the commissions are big in that space. So I'm just being honest with you. That's like something I've heard a lot of. And this makes me a little bit, you know, like, I don't want to disappoint you and have to look at my stuff and then say no. So yeah. I'm just a little bit uncomfortable. Hey, quick time yeah. check. We are 40 minutes in. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to go, Sean? Yeah. Two, two okay. more minutes. Yes. So, so first of all, as always, your heart is incredible. Thank you for sharing exactly how you feel and exactly what you heard. And um, when it comes to all of the different financial products that are out there, there's fees, commissions, and everything that we do across the board, especially when you look at it over the life of the relationship. So what we like to do when we sit down is we want to measure fees from beginning to end. And, and measure that against all the decisions that you're making so you can take a clinical look at what that looks like from a fee perspective. Now, when you have managed money, uh, the fee comes directly out of your money. When you, have, when you do life insurance, there's a commission that's paid by the insurance company that does not come from your money. Now, the argument would be, well, yeah, the commission is front loaded and that depends on the product uh, that, that is uh, being purchased and, and shown when it comes to the insurance strategies that we've discussed, uh, the products that we have put together for you are really less upfront for the agent because of all the different um, high early cash values that are involved in some of the things that we've been talking about. But once again, this just isn't a life insurance conversation. This is a full planning conversation that uses life insurance over your lifespan and beyond and how to really have the insurance company pay in the most tax efficient manner for all the things you want to do while you're still investing in the market. No one's saying don't invest in the market in this scenario. What we're saying is, is take an approach to the market where you could use it as a turbocharger to get multiple uses of each and every dollar by tying it into your life insurance. So you could buy these other businesses that you want to buy while you're still in your earning years and keeping your money in motion. And by doing that, 
it will tend to stay ahead of taxation. It'll stay ahead of inflation. And, you know, in the moments, and I don't like sharing this as a reason to do it, but if you took take the insurance piece and plug it into your overall portfolio, in these moments when the market goes down the way it's going down, and it will come back, your life insurance is not affected at all. As a matter of fact, your cash value is a steady eddy. You get that guaranteed rate of return by state law and by contract, as well as the dividend. And just like if the market goes up 30%, you still get the same rate of return. So having that in your overall portfolio creates a seatbelt for the long term on the things that you can't control. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rob. Um, yeah, I'll think about it. Thank you. And, and Sean, when, when in the process of thinking about it, and I appreciate that, um, do you have a team around you that helps in that thought process? Uh, I do. I do. And, and uh, I'm not sure if I got all the members of the teams. Would you mind if I jot down the names? All right, I'm going to call a quick timeout, and we're going to we're going to switch it around. So let's hear it for Rob Gill. Get some work, sir. Woo! All right. Now we're going to take this sucker, and we're going to we're going to optimize some distinctions. Rob. So let's talk about what Rob did well. Rob is very uh, eloquent, and articulate. Um, he listened well. Um, he demonstrated that listening by his uh, lengthy acknowledgments. Uh, he is clearly rhythmic in his presentation of the information. Um, he is likable. Um, he is present, uh, despite the technological challenges we had, which are just outside of uh, everybody's control right now. Um, so I was all good stuff. I would say access points for acceleration. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to exit, I'm going to demonstrate them could have been shorter acknowledgements, shorter questions, some tightening, um, uh, and could have been less when, when in the unique, and I'll, I'll demonstrate in the unique identity phase, it could have been less about the, the products and the elements, which are relevant, but some more about Rob and have me fall in love with Rob even more because Rob's got an amazing heroic unique identity. Um, and then the objections could have been a little bit more, put the objection in the middle of the bullseye, put it like on a, a, on a target, right? Write the bullseye, frame the objection, step into the objection and blow up the objection. So let's go. So um, I'm going to be, I'm going to still, I'll, you'll still be Rob. I'll still call myself Sean. So we don't screw up calling each other the wrong names, but I'm, I'm selling you on what you just sold me on and you are me even though we keep our names. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'm you, even though, even though I'm Rob. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you know what? Let's reverse it. Just let me just be Sean. Five. You're Sean. I'm Rob. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a genius. Right. No, no, you don't understand. I'm a genius. I see everything. <laughs> Rob has been waiting for this moment for his entire life. No, no, come on, stop, stop. We can't be have fun. Don't have fun. Okay. All right. So here we go. So, hey, um, Sean, it was, it was a pleasure hearing you speak. And uh, it was mind blowing. I, I came into this really thinking I was coming to a networking function. I was like, what's this lawyer guy going to talk about? And you really blew my mind. And I just came out of some really interesting uh, Tony Robbins seminars. And I'm, I'm feeling a little bit out of the, my motivation, my inspiration from that. And I'm like locked into uh, what you're talking about. So really, thank you. You did an awesome job. Well, thank, thank you for listening, Rob. I appreciate it. And, you know, thanks for coming up to me and, and uh, talking about the father. that brought some memories back. Um, and uh, I was really shocked to hear about David Stack and may he rest in peace. But, you know, thank you for Thank you for coming up and, 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 you know, really reach out to me. Definitely reach out and I'll definitely call you right back the next day. Yeah. Hey, so can I ask this? Do you have, you have five minutes to chat or no? Sure. Yeah. Hey, so thank you. So what's your relationship with the FA? Like I heard you talk about him, but like, what's your really, like, what, what was your relationship with, with Eddie Ford? You know, um, when I was in high school, I was, you know, I played baseball and uh, as you heard me talk about last night and there was a, um, there was a summer camp that Eddie invited me to through a, a person that I knew from my school. And, you know, Eddie's, you know, Jersey city guy in and out, really good friends with Bob Hurley. 
And, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit and he's no nonsense. And I found myself in a van full of um, tremendous New Jersey based talented baseball players, even like wondering if I belonged. And um, I, I forget if it was a five, seven hour van ride wherever I went, but, you know, just being around those guys, I leveled up so much that, you know, it was perfect for me because after that weekend trip, I think all my letters from college came in to where I could go play baseball. And um, once I was around, you know, guys that were at my level or above, it really, it really gave me the confidence once I saw what I was able to do, which I, you know, on one of the days I just kind of dominated. And I don't say that egotistically, I did so well that, you know, that eventually landed me to where I went to college. So I'm, I'm hearing, like Sean, that '84 like changed your life. True, not true. Yeah, I would say he did. He was he was definitely a person in my life that changed my life. And there was many of those along the way. He happened to come as I was going into my junior year of high school. Wow, wow, and and tremendous. And so when you you I think you said you went to Columbia, um, like what was that experience like? You know, I was I was the captain at Columbia, and uh, Rob, can you still hear me? Yes. Great, great. I was a captain at Columbia, and uh, you know, I I loved my experience there. I was on my way to potentially playing pros, but that's when you know, as I shared with you the other night, that I had a a visual disability, and that's when it began to surface during the time when I was at Columbia. And, um, you know, eventually it led me to go to law school, but that's when my baseball career ended. I think I could have played pros had I not had that challenge. Um, but, you know, my Columbia experience was awesome. There were some challenges along the way where, you know, I was up and then I was down, but then I got back up because I really began to practice a lot of principles that I was sharing with the other night. I just didn't have a language for it back then when I was in sports, but it really dis- I really discovered a lot of different things. Yeah. And, and thank you for sharing all that. And, um, you know, I, I did hear you when you were speaking, talk about the correlation between your athletic career and how that translated into your business career after law school and those breakthroughs. Can I ask you this? Um, cause I, I wasn't clear on this. Why did you go to law school in the first place? Um, I don't know that answer, Sean. I, I, I think that, uh, I think it was conditioning. You're, I know your aunt was an attorney. Uh, your, your uncle Jimmy was an attorney. My uncle Jimmy was an attorney. No, he was a die doctor. Sorry about that. Yeah. But my yeah, aunt was an- so- the, the answer is, it's all good. We can skip. So to, for purpose of our role play, we'll just skip yep. right on answer for me. So, um, and we'll accelerate to get into some of the dynamics. So we're going to build emotional rapport. I would have taken Rob uh, or Sean through where you've been, where are you, where you're going and say, so let me ask you this question. Let me fast forward to that. Um, like, why are you doing all of this? This is, it seems like you don't have to be. So why are you doing all this? uh, Thanks for asking that. And and I appreciate the the compliments. I can tell you when I left law school and like when I was going to college for baseball, there was a lot of law firms that recruited me, some of the best ones on the street. And, um, you know, I took a job and, and I was walking in there as the next greatest thing, maybe the Tom Cruise of um, that movie. I forget the movie. Um, and I was walking in there and within a week I felt defrauded by law school because I didn't realize that the way of the world was sales and influence. I had no idea. Uh, integrity-based sales and influence. Yeah. And, um, and I learned that pretty fast. And it was funny. It didn't take me long that I wanted to quit that job. And, you know, my mom was going bananas. Um, I would, you know, I would have just went to coaching sports at that point. And I remember one of the guys that I worked with at the law firm asked me if I should see a counselor. (laughs) (laughs) counselor. (laughs) So, um, you know, it was, it was at that point that I really began to, I go back to, to the mighty Dr. Chuck Berg who gave me a book, um, that Tony Robbins wrote awake the giant within and that book literally changed my life. Another life changing. Uh-huh. Pivot. Yeah. So, Sean, I hate to, I, I know your time is short. I, I look, can I ask you one more quick question? Cause I don't want to time out on, on your story. And I know your, your time is precious. Yep. Um, why do you care so much about other people? You know, because if I could take it, if I could take the gifts that I have 
and the way I see things and the vision that I have and my ability to, to move within structures and prisms and wrap that up in a gift and give it to everybody I would. And I just can't. I don't know how to do it. The fact that I've I put language to a formula that I've created over the last 22 years, and that's the only way I think I could communicate this message, and it's my life's mission to do it. Wow. Brother, um, and I say this, I say this, and please take it in the right prism, because we're both from Hudson County. If you're for real, and I believe you're for real, you know, I hope you are, um, this is extraordinary. And like, I, I can't believe I met you at Rooney's Crab House. Like, I don't know what you're doing at Rooney's Crab House. I, I don't know how all this worked. Um, but could I just ask you one more thing? Like, if you don't get to all this, and all of it doesn't work out. And, you know, let's say you just get head in the head with a coconut and decide to go surfing. Like, how would that land for you when it was all done? Like, how much does it matter to you to give it all away to people? You know, it, thank you once again, Rob. Um, it matters everything to me. Now, as I go through this journey and I know in my heart and in my mind, I give it all I got and there's no regrets. And if I fall short, knowing I gave it all that I got, then I'm comfortable with that. However, if I do get hit in the head with a coconut and I decide that I just want to surf and find myself with, with regrets, that would be such a disappointment to me and to the legacy that I want to leave behind. Not for me, but to have a bunch of people being able to understand this formula, to be on their own stage and to create their movements off of this, once again, this is not an egotistical thing. I believe it's my human duty to share this information with everybody. Extraordinary. I feel it. Thank you. And, and for you, when you, when you think of people you team with, uh, Sean, and that you want to work with, like what kind of people do you look for? You know, Rob, these are great questions. Um, and I think that, you know, traditionally when people go for a job, they have to, you know, they have to have a resume and, and somebody has to know somebody and has to be references. And I think, you know, if we go across the averages, that's a normal thing to do. But I think for me and the mission that I'm on and understanding not everybody was raised equally and had the same equal opportunities, I like to look more into the human side and really get to know people through asking the right questions, digging deep into those questions. And, and I've been around long enough to know that I could hear certain things uh, part of losing my 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 vision potentially has has really sharpened my senses in other areas. My listening is, as um, as as uh, a good friend of mine, Fernando says all the time, sharpening my listening. And I think in that space, I really like to listen and feel in my heart if this is somebody I want to work with. Now, quick out of role note: I would ask uh, Rob some more. Que I mean, I would ask Sean some more questions to clarify that of how he knows when he finds that person in a little bit more detail. So we're not going to do it for the sake of time. Skipping yeah. to step three. So I want to check in with you five minutes. Yep. Yeah. So step three, so transition. So Rob, um, I mean, Sean, would it be okay? Thank you for like sharing this extraordinary story, like mind blowing. Um, would it be okay if I shared a little bit about myself? Yeah, please, please. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Yeah, no, thank you. So um, yeah. Like you grew up in Hudson County, um, didn't have money, paying the bills was an extraordinary problem at all times, like 24 seven. Parents fighting over it, lack, addiction in my family, pain. I fell into addiction, was shot at, had crazy things happen in my life. And eventually I realized uh, that I wanted out, got myself um, into a program. Uh, AA, 23 years, been sober. Uh, also got myself to Wall Street. And it was, it was really fun and exciting. I made money. I learned principles of influence. And I also learned that not everybody there was operating in a space of love for people and maybe some more love for money. And it, it caused me some pain and heartache. And I eventually realized who I was and what I want to do in the world. And Sean, what I want to do in the world is I want to work with people exactly like you. 
People are making an extraordinary difference. People care immensely and people are forced for good. And as I look at like what you have, I realize like you, like most people have your area of genius and, and respect that mind. And most people like you have insurance and financial people come at them left and right all over the place. And I don't think there's much I could say in, in this conversation to convince you I'm not that, except I'll say this. If you, you seem like a person from everything you said that is discriminating, deep thinking and caring about what you do and where you go. Uh, my belief structure is that you probably read a bunch of books on money and finances um, from what my feel is that you probably don't trust a lot of people fully, that they know what they're doing. And that would include me. So what I would be blown away honored if I could have the privilege of demonstrating to you, identifying some possible mistakes you're making, money you're losing or overpaying in fees. And even if you're just in the S&P 500, that's all you're doing, how even that strategy leaves you exposed. And I could start like guessing and doing ideas, but what I will for a second, my hallucination is with the, an asset like Calgary Law that you don't have the right insurance coverage to deal with the taxation issues upon your death. I could be wrong, but that'd be a guess. And I'm going to guess that the blending of tax strategies and um, financial investment strategies and appropriate minimization of fee structures and taxation is something that is not yet optimized. So what I would love to do is take a look and see if I'm wrong. The time investment will be all mine. Mm. If we find nothing, it's all on me. But I'm going to make you bet if you're like most people are going to find something. And it's usually something pretty significant. And like I just said, because I could feel you're beginning to think that's what my job is, to create like a little bit of disruption to your knowingness and to say that, yeah, like what if something happened tomorrow? What's the transition strategy for Calgary Law? What's the life insurance taxation strategy? And if that by itself is not in place, we need to sit down like yesterday. You told me you have three kids. You love them. They're a big part of your mission. And all you have to lose, I'll sign an NDA, all good is just oh, somebody putting a few pieces of paper together. But please let me give a second look at what's going on. How do you feel about that? Sean, uh, thank you for laying all that out. And uh, you're right, you know, everyone does call me, and I'll use my words, Rob, with the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, you can't imagine, I'm sure you can't imagine how many phone calls I get or how many people want to set up meetings. Um, and thank you for acknowledging that. Um, you know, he, here's the thing. I love to engage in an open conversation. Um, make sure that, you know, understanding that my goal is not to waste your time. Uh, at the same time, I don't want to be committed to saying yes today. Uh, but I'd rather be just committed to having an open conversation and explore this with you. Yeah. So can I tell you what I just heard you say? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for saying it. I heard you say, I'm scared to let you take a look because I don't want to make a mistake at who I let a little bit more deeply into my world and or I don't want to be sold and pressed into doing something. Did I hear you correctly or I misheard you? Um, I just don't want to be pressured. Okay. So thank you. So that's a yes, right? And am I, Sean, you have the ability to like blow me up. If I pressure you, I will not pressure you, but I'm telling you, brother, you are not sitting prepared. And if you continue to not sit with somebody because you're afraid about being pressured and sold and not want to hurt somebody's feelings, which is just not who you should be in the world, you're not taking care of business the way that you take care of business in other ways. And I'm not pressuring. I'm telling you the truth. Yep. I'm not going to lie to you. So the only way to do that is by taking a look at what is currently happening and laying it all out with you. So I'll ask uh, you in love, yep. you know, would you give me that opportunity and trust me, I'm not going to pressure you. I will not only, I'll give you the opportunity to do a look on everything I have um, and be open to 
the feedback that you will give and you know like anyone because you're right i've done i've read a lot of books and i've done a lot of research and you know i like to keep it simple and uh in having an open conversation um as because i don't know what you're going to uncover or not uncover i don't know you know there could yeah. be mistakes that i'm making but i feel pretty good about what i'm doing um but you know i'm smart enough to realize i'm not that smart and for me it's about a trusting relationship in time, T-I-M-E, things I must earn. And um, I'm very open to having these conversations with you. And I will turn over all my financial data so you can look into whatever you want to look. I won't leave anything out. Right, Sean, that's all I'm asking for. And I'm going to earn your trust. I'm going to show you what's happening. And I'm also going to be uh, an incredible friend and ally. And that's what it's going to look like. And I'm, I know you have people talking to you all the time. And the fact that you're trusting me to do this, I can't tell you how much I cherish it, cherish it and appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you. And then I have a schedule. So, Fernanda, what is present for you as we, we couple of teaching points and take it home? So what is present for you and these dynamics? Then I'll kick it to Rob for what's present for him. A couple of teaching points is... Um... To, to be tactical, you know, length of questions. What, what's also being present for me is um, the length of the indispensable elements, whether it's acknowledgement or validation. Definitely um, the power of transition questions between the steps are very clear. Listening was something that was very prominent throughout both parties, um, both parties listening. There was different levels between both, yet both um, 5D listening was present in both shares. Um, and it's also the power how uh, when you ask the questions into the listening of the other person, you steer the conversation where it ends up in truth. And then as you at towards the end of your conversation, when we were stepping to agreement formation objection, it was leaning into the real fear, not what was given um, at first glance. So I'll pause there and let you say that again. Home. Repeat that. That's a that's a drop the mic takeaway. Repeat that last sentence. Leaning into the objection and not receiving the surface level of the first one that was given. I need to think about it. I need time. Let me see. It was, you know, purely clarifying, verifying questions, you know, stepping back to pain and yes strategy in step four of agreement formation. It's clarifying the no, putting it on a bullseye, blowing it up with a bazooka, as you would say. And uh, that was proof of it. So as all of our live ecosystem is listening, you know, listen to, you know, the fun of everything that are these calls. More importantly, listen through the prism of the formula. Um, and that was mastery in clarifying, verifying questions, stepping into yes strategy and ending in agreement formation. Awesome. Rob, what was present for you, brother? Thank you, Fernando. That was great. Um, first of all, Fernando, that was, uh, that was phenomenal. And I do like how you circled back, um, going back into the pain and, and really clarifying that question. Because when you're, you're, this conversation was to lead to a meeting that was going to lead to gather all the financial data. It wasn't about quote unquote opening an account, right? Because that would that wouldn't happen until later on. But there was a formation agreement from a standpoint of a willingness for me or you to give you or me all of the financial data that's necessary for you or me to do the job that we have to do. And by being very direct in the moment of of uh, step two to step three. Um, it was, uh, it was good. It was excellent. It was, it was a perspective that I needed to hear on how I articulate when people are just giving me their status quo, no, or, you know, default, no, or cling to the status quo, because that is a normal, let me think about an objection. Yeah. And so, so Rob, great job, brother. And for everybody, here's the deal. Know your outcome and know your truth. Know your outcome and know your truth. You know, there is never a reason for somebody to say no to a look-see unless they're just afraid they're going to get hard-sold and pushed. And that's the real fear, is that they're going to have to say no, and it's going to feel uncomfortable, and they're deepening the relationship. So understand that people's emotional objections are rooted in their fear of failure and rejection, right? So their objections are rooted in fear of uh, rejection and fear of failure, rejection from others. Why'd you let him look at this? Who's this guy? I got to go now tell my financial people, look at, like, give the stuff over to Ryan. Like, not another guy. What are you doing? I don't want to do this work. Like, they might say that, but that's the vibe that somebody's dealing with. 
it's rejection, even if it's small rejection from others. And then like yeah. fear of failure, like, oh my God, this person doesn't know what they're doing. So we have to, we have to be listening more deeply and contextualizing the objections. In addition, Rob, you worked your butt off at listening and showing me you are listening and your acknowledgements and validations. They just got a little bit long. And you can encapsulate it into the shorter, which is like, I mean, your grand, like instead of your grandfather da, did da da da, grandmother did da 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 da, like the longer ones, just encapsulate and say, it seems like your grandparents were, like, and you said it eventually, were like your superheroes. And if you said just that, like the whole thing could have been encapsulated to, I'm hearing your grandparents are your superheroes. Yes. Got it. Yep. And it'd be like, and I, I have tears in my eyes when, if you just like went right to that. Got it. Because it's the truth. I'd be like, you know, yeah. And I keep yeah. talking about them. You know, it's just this short encapsulation. It's like the headline encapsulation from your heart of what was just shared, not the regurgitation. It's like level five listening takes the facts and encapsulates them. Like, ready? Rob. If you told me your whole story growing up, it sounds like, brother, you love your family deeply and you want it to be very different than your family. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Is that like, how much did that land, Rob, on your heart? 100%. Yeah. Change, change in the trajectory of the generations. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's it. It doesn't have to be, and I know you did this, then that, then this, then that, that, right? It's just the encapsulation that shows I got it. And in fact, it shows even more that we get it if we could shrink it into one sentence, mm. right? Yeah. That shows we even got it more, right? So we have that for rapport building. Um, for agreement formation or for your, your unique identity, all of yours, you know, and Rob, I would, I would be tightening um, I would have an upfront story about you. Like I shared, you know, just re-listen to this where I shared who you were and why you're doing what you're doing and a lot less about all the products and the services and stuff. And you're so rhythmic and so brilliant there. But I think that could come much later. Uh, and maybe not at all in the upfront. Let me take a look. Got and it's it. only when you get into the objections that you can begin to go there. But the bottom line is, it doesn't make any sense to not let you take a look. It just doesn't make any sense to not let you take a look. And, and you could be doing that for like, hey, let me see if your carpets are dirty to, hey, let me see like, you know, what we might be able to look at in terms of saving money on taxes if you're Courtney Epps or Dan Geltrude. It could be, let me take a look at your insurance situation. It could be, let me look, take a look at your fees and your financials and 401ks and your whole plan. Like, it could be, yeah. hey, let me take a look at your contracts if you're a lawyer. Like taking a look is basically what everybody on this line is selling. Hey, let me just take a look. And it doesn't take a lot of facts and benefit throwing to get to a look. What the look is really about is the pain of what you're missing. Mm. I want to take a look at your contracts. You know what I, I saw, Rob? Brother, I don't know what your contracts are, your employees, your people partners, but I, I saw this. I was in a case where the two parties combined spent north of $25 million in legal fees fighting. Ugh. And if they had a couple of clauses in there, it would have saved maybe all of it. But instead of $25 million, I'll make a bet, it would have been under a million. Wow. Do you hear the wow? It was genuine. Yeah. So let me take a look at your contracts because brother, like that's what's at stake. And these guys are best friends, bro. like, right. So you're, you're demonstrating to people what they could be missing and the pain of it super concisely, not all the potential benefits, the pain point that not taking a look could cost them. That's all. And I can feel that landing. Do you feel that Rob? I do. Yes. 100% because that's real life. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Really, yeah. yeah. All right. So stay with me for one more second. Uh, Fernando, Jared, any final finals from you guys before we bring it home? No, Sean. Everything's good on our end. I believe Jared is great as well. So please take us home. Yeah.
So listen, everybody, sorry for the technical difficulties. We are mapping and ironing that out, um, you know, going forward. But the teaching points, the takeaways, this is how you create massive acceleration in getting yourself booked to speak on a podcast, on a webinar, on a, to have a sales meeting, at a sales meeting. This is what it looks like. More money, less time, more magic. Rob Gill, one final chance. We're all blind. And we're learning to see. Love you, brother. Just oh. learning to see. Oh we'll, see you. we'll see you on the huddles on Monday morning. <laughs> Bring people, get the message out there, and we'll talk to you later. Love you, brother. We're learning to see. Oh, my God. Fun Friday. <laughs> Goodbye.